Today, as you listen to this teaching by Pastors Ralph and Joanne Hone, we hope you'll enjoy it and learn some practical ways to walk into the awesome life God has for you. For more information and for more free teaching, visit our website, www.tapintothesource.com. So, we um, really, our, our church has been birthed in um, kind of radical faith and supernatural things. It's how we started, it's how we move forward, and it's all we know to reach forward towards. I never want to do church mediocre. I never want to do church in a way where it's just common. I believe God has called us to the uncommon because he's called us to the supernatural, which means it's no longer natural. So we're going to explain, we're going to share with you a little bit of our journey. Some of you already know of it, and some of you don't. And um, if you're a guest with us today, thank you for being here. You're going to hear a lot about who we are as a church, what we believe. Today, we're not going to be sharing a lot of scripture. So if you kind of go, man, they don't preach from the Bible. We do preach from the Bible. But today, as I said, we're starting the movement, trying to explain to you who we are as a church. And, um, and, and it's going to be good. A little bit of how we started. It was about eight years ago when God got a hold of our hearts. We were teaching the Victorious Living class and... Um, uh, we were attending a different church. We were just lay people, and God just kept increasing it and increasing it, and miracles just started breaking out. And after a while, people would walk up and give us checks that were blank and said, this is for your ministry. We're like, no, no, well, just go ahead and give that to someone else. That doesn't belong to us. We're not a ministry. We're just here to help the kingdom of God. And we were praying and believing, God, we need to find a church that still believes you for the supernatural. You know, you would think that, that church, that should be an easy thing to find. That's not an easy thing to find nowadays. People that will believe that God can still do miracles in your life today is a hard thing to find. And so as we look forward, we were looking for a man of God that would step forward and we would get behind him financially and support him because we were always big financial supporters of the church for years. So we were looking and looking and looking, and we couldn't find the person. When we thought we found somebody, all of a sudden they said, well, they're not interested. And it gets a little frustrating. And all of a sudden we were in a service one time visiting at a church, and the power of God hit both Joanne and I. And a prophetic man spoke, and he says, you're leaving the business world, and you're going into ministry. We said, well, that can't be us. Come on, somebody. <laughs> As our bodies were completely shaking, both Joanne and I and the people that were with us were laughing at us. They said that, that was funny. Hey, I we were think, just sitting out there in the chairs minding yeah. our own business. I think close to the find you. back row or the second back row. So be careful in that back row or the second back row. And all of a sudden, God got a hold of us and shook us to our literally core and said, I want you to start. And we thought, well, but, but that wasn't really what we wanted to do. Come on, people. God sometimes will take you and stretch you out of your comfort zone to take you places and spaces that you didn't think you would go because his plans for you to prosper you and not to harm you and give you a hope and a future, he'll take you to places that will excel you even though your feet are dug in like this because that's how ours were. You know, I'm not doing this, God. And he's whispering, come on, come with me. I've got something better for you. But no, have you ever had a kid lock their feet up? Drag, I'm not going to do this. I still remember our, our, our uh, oldest son, Brett, who's now married. Um, when, when we had him at church one time, it was up north in a very conservative type of church. And he was kind of very active in church. And finally, Joanne decided just to take him out. And as she's taking him out, he's screaming, Don't beat me, Mommy! Don't beat me! <laughs> he was doing one True of these story. with his feet locked in. But you know what? A lot of times, God... And I didn't those... beat him. And I didn't <laughs> beat him. Okay. Good to clear the record. Yeah. <laughs> Ask him later if that was true. No, I'm kidding. But sometimes with, with our feet locked in, God says, but I've got to take you to places. Why am I sharing this? Because for some of you, you're doing one of these with God too. And God's saying, but I, what I'm going to give you and where I'm taking you is going, to, is going to not only set you free, but your family free. It's going to walk you into a level because God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. Now, one of the things that, so finally we agreed. We're like, okay, 
God, because, you know, by the time we had this prophetic word, we're like, we have a choice. We can choose to obey him or we can do our own thing. And we can do our own thing. He's still going to love us, but we're never going to live in all that he has for us. So we decided to start the church. And uh, we're like, well, I don't know when this is going to happen. I don't know how. And we were like, God, but what about this and this? And everything he just supernaturally started bringing to us from chairs to locations. And it was like, oh, okay, we're doing this. Well, long story short, within a six-week period of time from that moment, we launched the Source Church, which was December 2nd, 2007. And um, we didn't even know where people would come from. And all of a sudden, you know, 21 people showed up. And we're like, oh, you know, okay. We, it, literally, we did not know what we were doing. The night before, we're like, what do we do for worship? Well, we put DVDs with subtitles on. You know, Darlene Check, amazing worship leader for the first, you know, year of our church. But we didn't know what we were doing. But what God so clearly showed is he says, just follow me. And, you know, the first thing our instinct was, let's get some books. Let's call some people. Let's get into, you know, let's check out some denominations. Let's check out some networks so that we can be trained how to do this. And he so clearly told us, no, I'm going to show you how to do this. I want something different. We're going to do it different. Just follow me. So for about a year and a half, he truly secluded us. We couldn't even pick up a book on church planting. He just wanted us to do it different. And so that's how our journey started. And we saw the supernatural and miracles right from day one. And um, so that has always been our heart, is just to follow God. So sometimes we do things different. You kind of go, well, that's not how my church does it, or that's not how my old church does it. No, but it's just how we're, we just want to follow God and um, do it his way. So but, it was about, it, we were about three years old. Well, can I say the name? We, yeah, we named ahead. it The yeah, Source, because we're like, what do we call this church? And um, because one of the heart of our, um, the very heart of us is that God is the source of everything. So in that, we just thought, you know what, if he's the source that's what we're going to call it, because we want to always point everybody to him being the source. So we were about three years old, and God dropped in our hearts. We were about probably 100, 120 people at the time, roaring. And uh, God dropped in our hearts and says, would you believe me for a building? And we said, well, sure, because we don't have any money. Come on, somebody. That's when we were two years old. Sounds good. Two years old. Two years old. So by the time our third birthday came around, this building was supernaturally given to the church debt free. Come on, people, that might be God doing a miracle. And when they appraised it, the last time was $2.8 million. Come on, somebody, that could be God. I got to check. Why, why is God in the miracle business? Because when you sit there believing God and you have no options to go another direction and you wait on the Lord, those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength They'll mount up with wings like eagles, and they'll soar. But the problem is we do, a lot of us won't wait on God. See, I always tell people if you really don't have another option, you got to wait. But that's the best place you could be. I, I remember having this dream one day, and, and we, in, in this dream, I, God was asking us to do something, and I said, but we don't have the ability to do this. We don't know what we're doing. We're way over our heads. Come on, people. Some of you have been there because God's put these visions on you, and this is what you're saying. And I still remember in this dream, all of a sudden, Kim, one of our great leaders of the church here, stands up, and she says, good, we're right where God needs us. See, that's when God will use you to do supernatural things because your ability is never going to cut it. What you can do can never cut it. But when you allow God to start operating in you and through you, that's when the divine happens and the super turns into the natural. You know, God has done so many supernatural things. You know, we've, he's helped us, you know, start thrift stores that allow us to minister to our community. You know, with a two weeks notice, we did a clothing giveaway for 1,500 people, you know, and just on and on. The, the list goes on and on and on and on. We've had situations where giving away food and we didn't have enough food, but yet it just kept multiplying. You know, so we've seen the miraculous over and over and over again. But I want to read to you Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19, because I really believe in my spirit. This is a, a verse that came up to us during the She Conference, and I believe it fully for this church. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? 
I believe he is going to do even new things. We celebrate what he has done, but we expectantly look for where he's going to go and where he's going to take us. We believe that there are bigger buildings for us as a church. We believe there is growth explosion. We have seen in, in our own visions that God has given us, as well as prophecies over us, that there are going to be thousands of people in the, in the church, that people are going to be lined up just to be touched by God, that there's just such a craving for his presence that, that they can't help but being here. I see you guys going out, and I'm not talking about just bringing people in here to be healed, but you guys being empowered to go out and you're praying with people in your workplaces. You guys are going to the hospitals and people are being healed. People who are just stuck in addiction are getting free. That's what we believe. That is where we're going. We're, you know, doing church is normal. If you just want a church where you're comfortable and just, you know, don't make me go outside my little box, we probably are not the church for you because we're going to bust open the walls of that box because God's got so much more. And there have been, we can't even count the number of prophecies over this church over the last three years about what God is going to do. And I'm excited, and I'm so excited. But the thing is, you know, we're starting the movement. What does the movement mean? A diverse group of people working towards a common goal. So what is that common goal? That goal is to experience all God has for us, to get everyone else in that same place, to cooperate with what he says about us, right? But in order to do that, we can't just do our own thing and expect it to get there. I believe that God has been cultivating a culture here. He's been cultivating a culture where we are ready for a move of God, where we are ready to bust out into the supernatural. So what we want to do is we want to walk you through some of the things that create our culture, that, have been the, that are the heartbeat of this church, so we are all on the same page to poised and ready for what God does, right? So this is where you can open your, um, your workbooks. And um, probably on about the third page, there's something I called values. Our core values. Our core values. So let me start with number one. It says, this church belongs to God. We are simply his managers. I don't run around and say, this is my church, my church, my church. Listen, I understand when people say, I'm going to my church. I get that. But a lot of people have taken ownership of the church. And we're talking you, about pastors. We're talking about pastors. And when they own it, God has no part of it. Well, it's quiet in here. Let me say that again. If I'm stepping on some toes and you feel some ouches, that's okay. If it's God's church, you will do what God tells you to do. If it's your church, you're going to do whatever you think you should do. So I say we're just managers or ambassadors, yeah, there's something about giving ownership to God because if you do that in your life, if your problems, those problems are no longer yours, they're His. That's why He says, cast all your cares on Him. When things are not going at, well at church, my, my conversation with God is this. God, you have some problems with your church. They're a little dysfunctional. Come on, people. <laughs> I'm just the manager. You know, if there's a fire in the building, the manager goes home at the end of the night and goes to bed. The owner stays up and he takes care of it. So God's the owner. He'll stay up and take care of it. Come on, people. Absolutely. And what, what happens is when we turn things over to God and say, this is yours, do with it, help us, give us wisdom to manage it, you now work as an ambassador. You now work as a volunteer to what God's agenda is. And the God then can move and do what he needs to do. Number two, we're going to get through these here. We value God's presence in person above all else. You know, we want to, um, when, when the Holy Spirit's moving and there's things going on, we are going to, to value that. We're going to move with him. We're going to do things that he's asking of us. But it also means that we're going to be um, very aware when it comes to people teaching or in our worship, we want to make sure that, you know, for instance, our worship team, they're leading us into that presence of God, that they have a relationship with God, that they love him, um, that, that they are in a place where they can usher in the presence of God. So we're very, very aware. We want to make sure that we're putting his presence above um, and his person above all else. Number three, we passionately love God, each other, and the world around us. We are a church that's based on love. 
we believe that, guess what, we all have our issues, we all have our stuff going on. But it's, you know, love trumps the all. You know, there's faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. You know, when Jesus commanded us, he said, um, what are the new, two new commandments? Love God with all your heart and love others as yourself. So guess what? People are going to walk in the door and they're going to be messed up and they're going to have issues and that's okay. Our job is to love them. Our job is not to fix them, correct them, or judge them. Our job is to love them. You know, our mission statement, which is just down the page, is to love and serve people to life. You know, it's as we love them and as we serve them and serve into their life that all of a sudden the life of Jesus is going to start coming up. Okay, so we don't start picking people apart. Well, you got to get this right. You got to get that right, you know. No, you know what? We're going to let the love of God work on them. We're going to let love trump everything else. Now, one of the other things is we believe that with God, the impossible is possible. In other words, what looks impossible, there's a reason why we have petition forms at the church, folks. And if you're online, just grab a blank piece of paper. Something in your life looks impossible. I want to encourage you to write it down. With prayer, petition, and thanksgiving, the Bible says make your requests known to God. See, he'll take the impossible and turn it into something that's possible that's if right. we just trust them. Right. So we believe as, as, a, as a church that when people walk in, they say, my, my job situation isn't going so well. My marriage situation is going so well. I'm dealing with some health issues. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with that. We say, hey, no problem. Just go ahead and bring it before God. We're going to pray over the end of these by the... By the end of the service, we will pray out over these and watch what God starts to do on your behalf. And that's when we allow him to take the impossible and make it possible for us. Number five, we believe God uses shaky people to do sturdy things. You know, he used us to start a church, and we didn't have a clue what we were doing. And we were shaky. And we were shaky, Okay. So we don't have to be going into something in, in complete confidence and knowing what we're doing. All we have to do is being obedient. You know, I'm Dominic Russo, good friend of ours, a 30-year-old guy who is just literally taking the world. He says, it's, um, if all you have is a word from God, a word from God is enough. You know, and sometimes God's asking you to do something. And all you need is that word from God because he is going to equip you. He'll pull all those things. He'll pull all the stops out for you if we're just willing to step forward. Um, number six, we believe united we are extraordinary, but divided we stay ordinary. I believe there's no room for division within the church and in with the church family. You know, I believe that's one of Satan's greatest tools, um, and we can disguise it like, oh, well, did you hear about so-and-so's prayer request? <laughs> Whoa! You know, and all of a sudden we start dividing and start feeling like that person's less than this person or whatever else. But we have to be united. And you know what? We're never going to agree on everything. If there's a hundred of us in a room, we're all going to have a hundred different ways to do church. It's not about all um, agreeing. It's about being united and saying for the sake of where we're going and for the sake of what God's doing, we're going to stand in agreement with each other. We're going to agree to disagree sometimes. And sometimes that's what we have to do to move forward. And in that, God honors unit, unit, you, the, 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 unity. Thank you. Yeah. That's an easy word, and I am tongue-tied. But um, the Bible says that where there is division, there is every evil work. So when there is division, when it starts breaking between relationships, that's when Satan comes in and just starts wreaking havoc. So we want to stay unified. You know, one of the other ones is we focus on life-giving tools and not rules. You know, we don't want to be the church, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Because when you talk to people that have been turned away from church, I don't like going to church. It's full of all these negative rules. I said, well, what's the problem? Well, all the things they told me not to do, I've done. I'm no longer good enough for church. Interesting. See, Jesus never came and gave and pointed the accusing finger at all of us saying, you messed up. I can't believe you're here again. Come on, somebody. He opens his arms. He says, I'm so glad you're back. See, we need to be that same kind of family that Jesus was. When Jesus was at the well and the woman came to him that had run around and had seven relationships or eight relationships, he didn't say, you floozy. 
He looked at her with love. He says, but when you drink from the water I give you, you will thirst no more. He raised the water level up. He didn't say what you did, because if he would have told her, don't, 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 she would have said, I already done all that. And that's what, that's the wonderful thing about God. He meets us right where we're at and takes us on a journey where we're at. So that's why we don't look at other people, well, they're not as far as I am yet. Listen, they're on the journey. That's right. God's working on each and every person because he loves them. Don't stop praying for family members that you have. Don't stop praying for neighbors that you have. God's got them on a journey, even though that they, they may have taken a side road and they might be off in the gravel. Come on, somebody. Yeah. God's not done with them. Number eight, we are contributors and not con just consumers. I think it's really easy to come to church with an, um, a mentality of what do I get out of this? I'm coming because I have a need. I need this. I need this. And there is truth. We come to get fed. But if we come with only what can I take in, and we don't realize that we also have to be contributors and, and give something, we're going to grow stagnant. If you have um, a body of water where nothing flows out, it only flows in, eventually it's going to go bad. So we need an inflow, but we also need an outflow to stay healthy in our life. So we need to make sure we're always realizing that when I come to church, and it might be just smiling and meeting somebody beside you and, and just loving on somebody. You see a new person and you're like, hey, how can I help you? Or how can I, you know, get to know you? Who are you? You know, what's going on? It might just be loving somebody. It could be serving, all these different things. But we aren't just consumers. We need to also realize that as a family of God, we are contributors. Number nine, we embrace God-led change. This is a hard one, okay? The tagline on our church, when we started the church, we put, are you ready for change? And after about three years and seven locations later, we were ready to rip that thing off, let me tell you. It was like, I don't want to say that anymore. I'm not ready for change anymore. But you know, the interesting thing is that change was the best thing and still is the best thing for us. Because what it does is it constantly makes us move out of our comfort zone. And as we move out of our comfort zone, we actually expand our capacity for more. We expand our capacity for what God could do. You know, we saw so many miracles. As I said, seven locations in three years. That's not always fun. But you know, what we saw was miraculous provision. You know, um, we moved church in one week once. We got up on a Sunday morning because two days earlier, our landlord had told us we had to move, got up on a Sunday morning, spoke on change, and said, guess what, guys? We're having lunch, and then we're moving the church. And we did. And you know how God supernaturally opened a door. In one day, we found a new location. We were in it the next Sunday, and, and God did huge things. It was a better location, everything else. We've seen him provide, but we've got to realize that we've got to embrace God-led change. And it's not always comfortable. So sometimes we get our feathers ruffled up a little bit, and we're like, oh, I don't want to do this. But change, when it's led by God, is good for us. Anything healthy should be growing and changing. Now, the last one is we come as we are and we do life together. In other words, we're all in different places in our walk with God. We're not criticizing each other. We're loving each other. And we're just all on the, on the move. We're all walking towards the high call that God has for us. And not every road is the same. Sometimes God takes some people up the back alley. Sometimes it's up the front street. Sometimes they're jumping on the house roofs. Come on, get in the cross. God might be flying people over for some of them. We're all, but we're all on the same team moving towards the same thing. I think if the church in general figured this out, we would take the world by storm. We don't need division. We need to work together and appreciate each other. So like I mentioned earlier, our mission statement here is to love and serve people to life. And so, you know what? What I love is this, this has become the culture of our church. So when people, um, you know, are difficult, even in your, you go to work and you see someone who's just difficult, you realize you're not fighting them. You're fighting the stuff that the Satan is trying to do in their lives and through their lives. So you know what? Let's just love them and serve them to life. And as you start getting in that that culture and that DNA, all of a sudden you start seeing life come into those people. It's like, you know what, they're changing. Why? Because you're loving them, you're serving them, you're showing them Jesus in a tangible way. But our vision, 
It's on that sheet. I want you to read it, and I want to just explain it and break it down a little bit. Our vision is to engage, equip, and empower. So to fully engage people with Christ and his church through the presence, power, and unconditional love of God. Equip them with easy-to-grasp practical teaching and tools and empower them to go and be what God has created them to be. So let me break that down. Engage. First thing we want to do, our goal, is I want people to experience God. I want them to experience a full personal relationship with him. I want them fully engaged in, in who he is, fully engaged in a relationship. Right? When you're engaged to be married, there's a, a, an intimate relationship there. It's a movement forward. I want them engaged. I want them to come in here and experience the love of God. I want them to come in here and experience the power of God. Okay, so our, that, is, that is such a key part of who we are. We want people not to just come in and get knowledge. Knowledge is good, but knowledge also needs the experience of the presence of God and who he is. Because how many of you ever met people who know all about the Bible, but don't have that relationship with Jesus? And it's not pretty, <laughs> okay? Because they're like, let me tell you what, you know? It always first has to be that engaged to Jesus. It's got to be that personal relationship. Everything else flows out of that. The knowledge, the wisdom flows out of that. The next part then is equip. Equip is what we are doing with the movement. We want to move you forward. It's great to have a relationship with Jesus, and it's vital, and it's the first step. But if we don't grow in that relationship and get equipped and trained, we're not going to become all that he has for us. Now, what we're doing in the movement, let me, uh, do we have the, the diagram? As I said, the, um, the movement is four phases. The first is committed. And that's what we're starting today. It's a four-week program. Um, here in our Florida campus, it's going to be the next three Sundays. So after second service, um, next Sunday and the Sunday after, it's going to be the class. And then the, the last class will be a party. And so parties are good. And we're gonna, it's going to be a graduation ceremony. And you're going to get a T-shirt uh, according to the different levels you're at. So if this is your first time going through anything, you're going to get a green T-shirt that says committed on the back, and um, you get to just uh, volunteer in a lot of areas. If you want to start pull, plugging into the church, committing, um, being involved, finding a team, it's in those teams that you're going to start developing relationship, where you're going to start finding your purpose, etc. So that is the green level. It's called committed. Um, and it's got discover the source, discover the heart of church, discover your interests, and discover your team. And so it's an exciting journey because you're going to just um, discover new things that maybe you didn't realize about church, about yourself, your personality. What interests, spiritual interests, has God given you? How, where do you see yourself going in church life? Where can I serve? That kind of thing. Um, then the next one, after you've done committed, you can go to advance, which is the blue t-shirts you'll see. Those are people who finished phase one and phase two, which is victorious living. Advance is all about us growing spiritually, advancing ourselves. We want to advance towards the goal of all that God's got for us, of being fully what he wants. So this is the stage where we advance ourselves. It's personal growth, personal development. Phase three, then, as you'll see, is disciple. And that's what you'll see a lot of um, t-shirts going on. Disciple is our everyday leadership class. And in that, what we're doing is we've grown ourselves, we've committed, we're serving, we've grown ourselves in victorious living. Now is about learning how to most effectively impact the world around us. Every single one of us are a leader somewhere. A leader in a family, a leader in our community. And I'm not talking about position, I'm talking about influence. And so this phase helps us to prepare to go beyond. When you finish that phase, when you've done those first three phases, you're going to get a disciple t-shirt. And um, this is sort of the last t-shirt you have. We don't have a, a t-shirt for the last one. But the last phase is multiply. And that is just a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. And that's not going to be for everybody. But for those of you who feel called to more ministry, who feel called that there's a deeper yearning inside of you for ministry things, that's where you're going to flow into. Um, but these are our phases. This is how we're going to equip you. We want you to reach the goal. And so we've put a clear-cut 
pattern, um, a clear-cut way for you to get there. We've started Victorious Living this week here in the Florida campus. Um, and we're going to be starting it in the Winnipeg campus. And also in the Winnipeg campus, you're going to do phase one all in a Saturday. Um, Pastor Rosa and will explain that to you a little bit later. I mean, you'll have a couple opportunities to be part of that. In Winnipeg, you're starting Victorious Living in October as well. So we all have a chance to quickly get through phase one and phase two. In the wintertime, we will do everyday leadership, which will get us through phase three. But we want us all moving forward. It's about equipping. Because then we can get to phase three, which is empower. Um, in our vision, empower. We want to keep developing areas and ministries. We want to keep uh, getting things out of your heart. What's in your spirit? And at this point in empowering, we want you operating in it. We want to get tools in your hand. We want to put teams around you that can say, I see this gift in you, or I see that dream you have. Let's get that dream in fruition. So our vision is to engage, equip, and empower. Too often we want to be empowered, but we haven't done the first steps. So we want to just make sure we're doing this properly, that we're, we're experiencing God, that we're being equipped, and then we go and we make it an impact. But you know, I want, to, um, I want to talk first, just for a moment, we're gonna step back to the engage, because in a, in a little bit, we're gonna ask you to join the movement. And if you don't even step through the rest of phase one, today you can join the movement, say, I'm part of the movement, I'm part of it. And we've never, it's basically our membership. But you may have never, um, like, we have not been ones that are big on membership because we've seen churches distort it and hold it over people and, well, you belong to me, you belong to me, you know, and all those kinds of things. And that is not what our heart is in this. But what I see is that when people make a commitment, they're willing to actually walk through things together that they wouldn't have otherwise. You know, we've made a commitment to marriage. So there's things we've put up with in our relationship that if we had just been dating, we may have not pushed through. And because we pushed through, we saw victory. And I think sometimes in our lives, without that commitment that we make, there's things we'll just walk away from when God wanted us to push through and grow and learn. So I want us today to just, and we're not doing formal membership. I'll explain it a little bit later. But I want you to have the opportunity to join the movement. But then I want to let us engage. I want us to experience God today. I want us to just have a moment where we experience his presence. But the first part of experiencing him and being engaged is having that personal relationship with Jesus. You know, I want to invite everybody, whether you're online, whether you're in the Winnipeg campus or you're here in this auditorium, just to bow your heads. We're going to take some time just to give you an opportunity to invite you to join the first part of the movement is making Jesus your Lord and Savior. See, without Him, you'll never walk in all that God has for you. He is. The Bible says, Jesus said, I am the only way, the truth, and the life to the Father. And if we want to walk in all that God has for our lives, we need to submit ourselves to Him. We need to ask Him to forgive us. We need to ask Him to get our lives right. So right where you are, whether you're watching us online on a uh, on a computer or on a TV or on a phone. Pray this out loud. God can hear you right where you're at. If you're in the, one of the auditoriums, just do, we'll all just pray together. We're not here to embarrass anybody because this is really between you and God. We won't ask you to stand up. We won't point a finger at you because your relationship with God is between you and Him. But we want to give you this opportunity to make sure you're walking right with him. So I'm going to ask you to repeat this after me. It goes like this. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, Jesus. forgive me. Jesus, would you be my Lord and my Savior? I invite you into my life now. Come and change it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. For more free teaching and information about The Source, please go to www.tapintothesource.com.
We hope you enjoyed this message. For more free teaching and information about The Source, please go to www.tapintothesource.com.